What's up, guys? Man, good to see you all. Uh, hard to believe that we only have one young adults left uh, in the semester, which is crazy to me uh, because it means Christmas is coming. Uh, and I'm that much closer to being a dad, y'all. So, like, it's crazy. I'm excited about that. Um, I appreciate that. I really am excited. I guess that's good that I'm excited uh, also. Hey, uh, we're glad that you're here. Listen, we're in part five of our series that we've been calling uh, If Then. Okay, we, we haven't done a five-part series like in a long time. So this is, you, you know it's some good stuff whenever uh, we've been doing it for five weeks now. And I love this series uh, where we've been asking the question, if someone is a follower of Jesus... If someone's a follower of Jesus, then what should their life look like? If somebody is a follower of Jesus, then what should their life look like? And we've been talking about it. Hey, we're almost in 2019. We're in 2018 where we have more access to information, more access to ideas and thoughts and opinions than, we, than in the history of the world we've ever had access to. Like, we can find anything. And that's no different than to hear thoughts and ideas and opinions about Christianity and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so in this time when we have all this different information, what we want to do is go back to a primary source. If you remember like your middle school history class, like a primary source is the best kind of source because it's somebody that was actually there to witness the event. And so what our primary source is, is it's, it's a letter written by one of Jesus' disciples named John who was, on his, was in his inner circle. Okay, this guy, John, he spent more time with Jesus than probably anybody else in the history of the world ever did. Knew Jesus, walked with him while he was doing ministry before he was crucified. And so what does he have to say about what it looks like to follow Jesus? And he writes this letter. Now, this is after Jesus has been crucified and killed, and, and John's an old man now. And he's writing this letter, you know, we talked about it, how when someone who's like older than you talks to you, you kind of lean in a little bit. Right, And that's what we're doing here when we look at this uh, letter of 1 John. He's an old man, and he's kind of writing to this group of believers. And so uh, I'm going to give you the main point up front tonight. Uh, our main point is this, is that if someone is a follower of Jesus, then they will give generously. And I just want to encourage you, if you guys have the High Street app, all of the notes uh, for tonight are on uh, the app, okay? So you can just click sermon notes and you can follow along with us. That's really helpful. If you don't have the app, search highstreet.org in the app store and you can uh, find that. But if someone is a follower of Jesus, then they will give generously. You got the main point? It's like, peace out, we're done for the night then, okay? I give it to you up front. I'm just kidding. But I won't speak for an hour like Michaela said. I promise you that, though. So <laughs> um, you guys just sigh of relief, okay? No? I can go for an hour if we want to. It's fine. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so if someone is a follower of Jesus, then they will give generously. They will give generously. And here's the deal is like, uh, I don't think we're typically generous people. Um, and what I mean by that is it's not always, uh, it, not that we're not generous, but it's not the most natural thing. At least it's not for me, and I don't think it's our tendency to be natural, uh, naturally gener generous. And so what I mean by that is, like, I see, I, I'm an elementary teacher, okay, and my wife's a teacher too, so we trade a lot of teaching stories. And the most painful part of being a teacher of young children is watching them line up. Like, it is a life skill that one has to learn. I saw Kathy laughing because she's a teacher and she knows. But when you see kids line up, it's like they're like, uh, they, they like shove each other out of the way and like there's body checking going on to get in line. You guys think that looks ridiculous what I just did, but I watch it all day long, every day, okay? That's what it looks like. And it, it doesn't matter, girls and boys both. Like, I'll have girls just like hip checking guys out of line and stuff. Like, it's, it's ferocious. And so, uh, I mean, there's a battle going on and it's because... I don't know that we're, we're naturally, like, generous people. We're, we're more selfish uh, by nature. And, you know, the thing with kids is they just hide, they don't hide it as well as adults do. Adults are the same way. Like, y'all have been in a Walmart line before and someone got in front of you and you're like, hold up, what just happened? You know, like, some people still don't know how to stand in line. They, they do and they just choose not to. And I think of my friend Derek. 
who goes to church here, and he was doing some uh, Black Friday shopping, not this year, but last year. If you go Black Friday shopping, what is wrong with you, okay? I'm sorry, I'm shots fired, but I'm just saying, y'all crazy, all right? Uh, and, and my friend Derek, he was doing some purchasing uh, for someone who worked for Amazon, so he would go to Black Friday deals, and he would buy the items, and then they would resell it for a higher price online, and so he was going to all these different stores, like shop for like 12 hours straight, and he was at Walmart uh, getting some sort of toy. I think it was like a Hatchimal or something. Uh, I don't know if like you know like kids' toys, but a Hatchimal apparently is some sort of like shell that breaks and a stuffed animal comes out. I don't know. I'm not up with it, but I think that's what he was buying. And they're like 100 bucks or something like that. And he had two of them in his cart. And he said he was in Walmart, like he just hit the sale, right? And he got in there, got what he needed. That a lady walks up to his cart, looks him dead in the eye, and snatches the Hatchimal from his cart and takes off. That's a grown woman doing that. And so uh, man, hey, the true colors come out. I'm telling you, adults just hide it a little better than kids do. But w w sometimes we're not naturally, like generosity is not our first inclination. And so um, the, the weird thing is, is that being a generous person, though, is beneficial to your life. If you act in a generous manner, it's going to be beneficial to your life. And uh, Research study after research study after research study has proven this, that if you are a generous person, your life expectancy will actually be longer, uh, that you're going to be happier, and you're going to be healthier if you're a generous person, okay? Uh, Time Magazine uh, wrote an article about a study uh, which was done in Switzerland. Uh, it seems like every study is like Switzerland or Finland. I don't know what they're doing over there, but like good stuff is going on. And so uh, they gave $100 to a bunch of different people who lived in Switzerland. And they said, hey, listen, they told one group, you have to spend this money that we gave you freely. Like you got to just spend it. And then they gave it to another group and said, hey, you got to spend it, but you have to give a portion of this money away. And it doesn't matter the amount, but you have to give some of it. you got to give it. And what they found at the end of the study and what they found throughout the study as they were doing MRI scans and everything else is that there was a lot more uh, activity in the people who were giving in their brain in the regions that dealt with generosity and that dealt with, uh, you know, happiness. There was more activity in those people's brains who were giving. And then at the end of this study and throughout the study, those people who gave, regardless of the amount that they gave, were happier on a regular basis. And you know what else studies show is that uh, if you're generous, it can actually have the same effect as taking a blood pressure medication, right? That's how powerful it is, that giving is something that has obviously been hardwired into our DNA to make us healthy. But yet sometimes it's hard to, to be generous, but I think we would all agree that we would like to live in a world where we saw more generosity and less selfishness. I would like to live in that world. I think that's something that I would aspire to, uh, aspire to be in life is to be more generous than I am selfish. And so when we're talking about generosity, what we do... <clears throat> with anything we're talking about here uh, at High Street and as a community of believers here at Young Adults is we open up scripture and we see what does God have to say about what it looks like to be a generous person? What does scripture have to say about generosity? And we already talked about how we're going to be in 1 John tonight. Uh, and it's this letter from old man John to a group of believers. And this is what he says in, in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. He says this, uh, by this we know love, that Jesus, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How does it abide in him? John says here, lean in, little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed. And in truth. So we see here that John's telling them, hey, listen, if you have something and you see someone in need and you don't give it, that there's an issue with that, that there's a problem with that. And when you look at verse 17, 
and where it says uh, the world's goods, okay? If you're in another translation, but this is the ESV, if you're in another translation, you'll sometimes see that as material possessions. If someone has material possessions, if someone has the world's goods, And so the whole New Testament was written in what's called Koine Greek, which was like common Greek that anyone could understand. And so when we go back to the Greek, the word that was actually used here, I think this is awesome, is it's called bios, all right? Bios, B-I-O-S, okay? And what that means is that, uh, and usually what we find in Scripture, this word bios throughout the New Testament is usually, usually referring to life in general. Think of what is biology, the study of life, right? And we see where that root comes from. But in this particular verse, what it's referring to is that by which life is sustained. It's talking about resources and wealth and goods. So if anybody has resources and wealth and goods and sees their brother or sister in need and does not give to them, how can the love of God abide in that person? If someone is a follower of Jesus, how could they not be generous. That's what John is saying right here in this passage. And I know what you're thinking, because this is kind of what I have thought over the years, and I still think is like, I don't, do I have something to give? Like, do I really have something to give? And especially in the young adult stage of life, we have people in here who, you might be in your freshman year of college, or you might be uh, just finished up with school, and you're paying off student loans. Uh, You work part-time, and you you don't have that many hours, or maybe you just bought a house, or you've got a kid on the way, or you've you've got a family at home to support. Like, I don't have much to give, right? And I think that's the tendency. When there's transition going on in life, it makes it harder to give, I feel like. But guess what? Like now that we're in transition, I don't think it ever stops. I can't look at a time in life where I'm going to be like, yeah, you know, there's no transition there. But we all have something to give. We all have resources and wealth and goods. Not to mention we live in the United States where uh, what we have financially is greater than that of people around the globe, that we are some of the wealthiest people in the world, that all of us have something to give. And who is John following, right? John was following Jesus. And this is what Jesus had to say. Well, let's go to a a, a portion of scripture out of Mark chapter 12. That just is kind of Jesus' thought process on giving. And it's verses 41 through 44. And I I, I just love this passage because I think it speaks to all of us in our young adulthood. It says this, and it says, And he sat down opposite of the treasury, Jesus did, and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. They're putting in bankrolls, right? Okay. And a poor widow came in and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. She had nothing. She just put a penny in. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had, all she had to live on. And what's most interesting about this is like John probably is there, right? And, and Jesus actually goes and says, hey, all my disciples, hey, guys, come here. He calls them over to him, right? That's what it says here. He calls his disciples to him and says, hey, I want you to know that this widow, like she just gave two small copper coins, right, to make a penny, It's pretty much nothing, and it might seem irrelevant to you, but you know what was right about what she gave? Her heart behind it. Go back up to verse 18 in in 1 John, and it says this. It says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In deed and in truth means to be like with action. Don't just, you know, you, you, you've got to actually walk the walk. You can't just talk the talk. That in deed and in truth, that's how you show the love of Christ, through your giving. It's all about the heart. And that's what this widow had right, is, is her heart was right. And that's why Jesus was like, hey, that's something to celebrate right there. We all have something to give. Every single person in here has resources and, and goods in some way. God has given something to us that we have to offer to other people, every single one of us, even if it doesn't feel like it, I promise you that we do. And so, like, we understand, uh, you know, that, that giving is something that is obviously looked well upon in Scripture. Um, and we understand that 
from like a scientific perspective, yeah, it's generally healthy. I mean, I would like to have a, a higher life expectancy. Uh, generosity would be a good thing to partake in. But why does it matter spiritually? Like, w- why does it matter spiritually that we give? What, what does it do for us in our relationship with God? And I want, I want you to understand this, that we often talk about reading scripture, which is an awesome thing. We often talk about prayer, like in communicating with God. Great thing again in fasting, giving up something for a period of time in order to set our minds upon God. These are all spiritual disciplines. But giving is a spiritual discipline as well. What is a spiritual discipline? It's something you can do to help you do something you cannot do on your own. It's something that you can control, something within your power to help you do something that is outside of your own power. Hey, listen, it would be awesome if we could just snap our fingers and have faith that would move mountains. I mean, I would take that. That would be an awesome thing. But it doesn't, we have to exercise those spiritual muscles. And we do that through engaging in spiritual disciplines. That's what builds faith. That when you're giving, you're actually doing something that is within your control in order to help you do something you cannot do on your own. I promise you, if you want to see God show up in your life, start giving. Start giving. I I tell that to people all the time, and we talk about it in my DNA group, and and the other guys in my DNA group encourage that also. It's like, hey, when when you give, like God is going to show up. I cannot tell you over the years that I've been here at High Street and and involved with people in the Big C Church all around the world that like the stories of when people give sacrificially, how God shows up. It's amazing. And you know why that's the case? One of the most popular uh, pieces of scripture that uh, people quote whenever talking about giving is out of the book of Malachi. It's Malachi 3.10. And who Malachi was is he was a prophet sent by God to speak to the Jewish people, to speak to God's chosen people at a time whenever they weren't really following after him, at a time when they had really stopped giving generously. And this is what he says to him in Malachi 3.10. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, and that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God is literally saying right there, put me to the test. If you want to see who I am, put me to the test and start giving. If you want to see who I am, put me to the test and begin to give out of a generous heart and give back to me what I have so freely given to you. God starts to challenge people. And I can tell you that every time in my life where I've ever like stepped out in that or when Em and I have stepped out in that, God has shown up. And that's not prosperity gospel. That's not, you know, saying, hey, if you give that God's going to make you rich or anything like that. But what he is going to do is he is going to bless your life and he is going to build faith in your life. I'm not telling you what it's going to look like. I don't know what he's going to do in return, but I can tell you that he's going to grow your faith from it. And that's not prosperity gospel. That's just not talking it up. That's what scripture says. God says, put me to the test in this. And so if God says, put put him to the test in something, we should probably take note. We should probably take note. So giving, it, it's, we all have something to give. And, and not only that, but like giving is something that's going to help us grow. When you give, you're going to grow. When you give, you're going to grow. But uh, what, what's interesting here in Malachi is that he talks about a tithe. And so what I want to do over this next uh, couple minutes is kind of just talk about what is a tithe? And then like if I'm a believer, if I'm a follower of Jesus. So if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus tonight, this next part isn't necessarily for you. You can hear what we have to say, but like you're not tied to this, okay? Um, but what is a tithe? And then like as a believer, what should I be giving? Like that would be probably something good to establish. Like how much do I give? How much do I give? And so when we look at a tithe, um, what we see is that a tithe is something, this is what a tithe is. It's giving a portion of what God has given back to you, or of what God has given you, giving that back to him on a consistent basis. A tithe is this. It's giving a portion of what God has freely given to you back to him and to thanks for his purposes on a consistent basis. It's giving back to God what he has already given to you. 
Why a consistent basis? Why is this a regular practice that you should go through? When you think about a spiritual discipline, and if giving is a spiritual discipline, then an act of tithing is a spiritual discipline. When you, ca- you can't just go to, the work at, oh, go to the gym and be like, I'm going to work out one time and I'm going to be super fit. It doesn't work that way as much as we wished it would, but you have to engage in consistent action. That tithing is actually a spiritual discipline. And what's funny about this is, this is, this is the way it always uh, happens. You know, you're speaking on something. And what happened to me, uh, oh, I, I, this last month, I started looking at my bank account, and I was like, something doesn't look right in there. Uh, I have too, there's too, too much finances in there. Something I isn't. So I started looking, and what I realized is I had missed my tithe in the previous month. And it didn't hurt me to go back and catch up, Right. And you see that number come out of your bank account. And like, that doesn't hurt me because I've seen God be faithful on a consistent basis throughout my life as I have given and tithed. So like, that didn't bother me. But what did bother me was this, is that I wasn't viewing tithing as a spiritual discipline. It's really important. Like, this is something that helps you grow faith. And so what I realized in in, in missing that was that, man, I wasn't paying attention enough to my finances and saying, how can I leverage this for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God when God, it's all God's anyways. And how can I give that back to him? And so for me, that was really convicting because I'm like, man, I was frustrated with myself because I didn't pay enough attention to it. It wasn't important enough for me to get like in that financial area to pay attention and say, hey, what does God have to say about this? That this is a spiritual discipline that I should engage in. So when we're talking about tithing, it's giving a portion of what God has given to you back to him on a consistent basis. We see this in the book of Genesis. We see it in Exodus, Leviticus. Uh, we see it in Numbers, 2 Chronicles, Malachi. We see this idea of tithing all throughout the Old Testament uh, in Scripture. And what some people will say is this, is that, well, Jesus he didn't really talk about tithing, which isn't true. They'll say that the tithing is really like an Old Testament practice. And because Jesus came and fulfilled the Old Testament, right, we don't need to worry about tithing anymore. But I think that that's, that's really an unwise way to read Scripture and to come to that conclusion. And here's why. Because when you look at the history of the early church, when you look at the book of Acts, Okay, when you look at uh, Corinthians, both the Corinthians, first and second Corinthians, when you look at Philippians, what was going on here in the early church was that people who were following after Jesus were giving to other people who were following after Jesus. They were meeting the needs of people who were in the church. They were supporting other churches. They were supporting the apostles who were spreading the message of Jesus, that giving was a consistent thing in the New Testament as well. And you got to remember the crowd that Jesus was speaking to. A lot of what he said was to who? Pharisees, scribes, uh, Sadducees, religious leaders of that time. They already knew the law in their head. And and there's one part in in the book of Matthew. It's uh, seven woes uh, to the scribes and Pharisees, which is basically like Jesus' seven complaints against the scribes and Pharisees. And in one part of this, he says, hey, listen, you, you scribes and Pharisees, you, you tithe of your, your mint and your dill and your cumin, but you, you, you forgot about mercy. You forgot about faithfulness. You forgot about justice. You know the tithe in your head, but your heart's wrong. And so that tithing is really a matter of the heart. And I think as we look at Scripture, we see on a consistent basis that as a theme of giving and tithing and giving to God's work, it's something we see all throughout Scripture. And so then you got to ask yourself, how, how much do we give? How much do we give? And if you've been in church, you know, like, people talk about this. It, you give your 10%, right? The first 10% of what you earn. There's a lot of discussion. Is that before taxes, after taxes? Is that gross income, net income? You know, how do we give on that? Okay? But when we look at Scripture, why do we, like, where do we get that 10% from? Where do we get that from? And I think the most obvious example of that is in Genesis chapter 14. We see that Abraham has went out to battle and he's been victorious. He feels like God's given him the victory. And so what does he do? He goes back to Melchizedek, who's the high priest, and he gives 10% of these resources that he's gained to God's appointed high priest. And so we see this act of like giving of your 10%, that starts to occur. 
And now here's the deal is if you were one of God's chosen people, like if you were a Jewish person, there were some other things you gave to as well. There was kind of like almost a community tithe that they gave that would go to sojourners and widows and the fatherless. And so some estimates would say that if you were a Jewish person, you gave anywhere from 22 to 33 percent of your finances, 22 to 33 percent of your finances. But, you know, what does that seem similar to, right? Giving to uh, different like things that withhold, which uphold the economic infrastructure of society. Like it reminds you of taxes, right? And so we see that Jews were tithing to a couple of different things. But what's clear from Abraham is that at least 10 percent of what he what he plundered, right, was given back to God as like a sacred tithe. And so that's where uh, throughout old, the Old Testament, we start to see this, thing, this idea of tithing and giving of the first fruits. That's where this starts to come from. And so we can see, like, and it's funny, like 10% is a good starting point, you know? When you think about what can I give back as a tithe and can engage in consistently, that 10%, that's like where we get this from. And, you know, you can sit here and argue and talk about it all day, and there's different thoughts and opinions out there. And, and you, you can get lost in just studying this stuff, all right? But it, it's funny, I, I love to call Pastor Eddie or Pastor Tom. Uh, pastor Eddie's our, our, our executive pastor or our lead pastor here, and Pastor Tom's our executive pastor. And I like to pick their brain and just say, hey, like, what, you know, what, what do we believe as a church? Like, you know, and, and just kind of dive into these, these kind of topics with them. And Pastor Eddie said this, and I thought this was so perfect. Is he's so wise, right? He's so wise. He said this, it's, it's not a matter of how little we can give and be okay, but of how much we're able to give. Pastor Eddie said that it's not a matter of how much we are, or like how little we can give and be okay, but how much we are able to give. So we can sit here and argue about all this different stuff all day long, but really it doesn't, it's, it's not about what's the minimum I can give and be okay. It's about how much has God given me to that I can be able to give. And I love that he said that because it just adds total clarity for me. It goes back to what we see in, uh, throughout the New Testament as well. And what we see in 1 John, he says, you know, hey, it's about like deed and truth. What's in your heart? We think about Jesus and that widow. What was it about? It was about her heart. Her heart was right. And that's what I think it comes down to when we talk about giving and when we talk about tithing as a spiritual discipline. It's a matter of the heart. And not a matter of like how little can we give and be okay, but how much has God given us that we could be able to give. And here's the deal. Um, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit of just about what High Street does. And in a way, when you're generous, these are some of the ways High Street can then be generous. Jared Bone, who, who leads our group here, uh, he helps run power packs. And I text him, hey, how many power packs do we give out a week? We give out 515 power packs to kids in need, to families in need. This is a backpack full of food on a regular basis. There's 515 of these we give out so that kids can go home uh, on the weekends and we don't have to worry about them being hungry, that we can meet the needs of those families. Let's talk about One Soul Purpose, which is an organization which was born out of High Street. And what they do is they provide uh, a new pair of shoes, a new pair of Converse shoes for all the Title I kids in Springfield. And at High Street, we put new shoes on all the kids' feet at Weller Elementary School every year. I don't even know how many years we've been doing that now. That's part of what it goes to. I think about when there was the, uh, the earthquake in Nepal, that we were able to rally together as a church and aid in a relief effort and give to our missionaries over there and support over there who are helping people in a time of need. That we support over 150 missionaries as a church. Then, and, and within our missionary groups, there's people that run feeding centers. There's people that have built sports facilities in at-risk neighborhoods. So kids can come in and have a place for free because they don't have anything anyways and they can participate in, in sports. I look at us as a church is that we give to people who are going through an adoption process that are members of our church. We give to people that are fostering children and taking children who are in a rough situation. We support them. You know, I coach football at Hillcrest over on the north side of town, and some of our kids, uh, you, you know, come to uh, us as athletes, but they don't have stuff to eat at home. Or we, and you know, it's kind of a responsibility of us as coaches and adults to help take care of them as they come to us, and we have to feed them when they're after school for long hours, or we have road trips. I've seen High Street come in and give to that, and give to that program, and that's that's just some of the examples of the way that when you engage in the spiritual discipline of giving to the church body, 
then that it affects people in ways you will never know and that we will never be able to see. We'll never be able to see. And, y- you know, um, I think of whenever Rob Lyons, who was a former leader in this group, I didn't ask permission to tell this story, but um, I-, I just feel like it needs to be said that, like, within this community, there are people who are generous Um, Rob was a leader within this group and he was moving to California to go and start a young adults group and work as a pastor at a church there for a group of people that had no young adults at their church, Cross Point in in California. And he decided, you know what, I feel like this is where God's calling uh, myself and Kyla uh, and and we're going to move there. That's expensive to move across the country. And I remember I had a guy come up to me and hand me an, uh, an envelope as we were kind of collecting like a love offering. I didn't look at, at the envelope and what was in it. I just passed it along to Rob. And I remember Rob comes up to me and is like, man, who, who, hey, listen, who gave me that envelope? Because they gave me like an incredible amount of money to help me in this move. And I just want to say thank you to him. And I was like, man, that's awesome. That's people in this community right here supporting one another as we're doing the work of God. That's phenomenal. That's giving generously. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you will give generously. You never know the effect it's going to have on somebody. You don't. And there's a story I heard in, in preparing for, for this tonight, and it was about a family uh, from New Orleans, okay? And uh, this family, it was a, a mom, a dad, and then a, 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 a child, and that things were not going well for this family. They were uh, very, they, they had no resources. They had no finances. They were down to their last leg, uh, probably had some mental health, health issues going on as well. And that this family was actually so broken, broken hearted, that they were at the point where they had made a suicide pact as a family, which is one of the most painful things I could even think of. That as a, as a family, they were going to end it all. The, the mom and dad agreed and uh, they were going to bring the child into this as well. And so they went to a gas station in New Orleans, and they went to purchase one last like time so, some food for their child. And they get to the counter, and as if they're not broken down enough, they get to the counter, and they can't pay for what they've got. But there was a man behind them. He had a South African accent, and they, the, the guy who he get, said, I'll never forget his accent. He, he, he says, hey, don't turn around. Don't turn around, but I just want to give you this money, and I want you to know that Jesus loves you. This, this, this man with the South African accent gives to him, and they purchase the food, and they go on their way. So they go, and they wept for hours. They decided they couldn't do it. They drove by a church, and on a sign outside of this church, it said, Jesus loves you. And they remembered back to what this man in the gas station had said to them. So they went into this church. And you know what happened is that their lives were changed forever when they heard the message of Jesus Christ and heard that their life had value and meaning and purpose. And there was a savior who had come for them and they accepted Jesus and began and entered into a relationship with him. Why? Because at a gas station, a man with a South African accent, because he was a former pastor and missionary to South Africa, said, hey, you don't need to look at me. I don't need any credit for what I'm about to do, but I just want you to take this. And you purchase what you need to purchase. Didn't ask any questions. Didn't make a big scene about it. And because of that, those people were saved. And nine years after that incident, this family was at a church. And they heard this man speaking. And they knew it was him. Because he said, I'd never forget his accent. And they got to meet this person who gave to them. When I hear that story, all I can think about is, That's the gospel. That's the story of Jesus. That's the story of God. That God sent his one son in an act of generosity as a gift to us to live a perfect life here on this earth and to serve as a payment for our sins. In Ephesians, it talks about it's a free gift. We didn't do anything to earn it, but God just gave us this gift and said, you know what, if you, admit that you've, if you admit that you're a sinner, if you admit that you've made mistakes in your life, and if you believe that Jesus is my son, and that after he was crucified, he rose again, and you confess him as your Lord of your life, that you can have this gift. All you got to do is accept it. That's the same story as that in the gas station, right? That's the message of the gospel 
a message of generosity that as Christ followers, if we are if we are a follower of Jesus, then we're going to be generous. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. I don't know where you're at on your faith journey tonight. And you might be in here and you're thinking, why are we talking about giving? Like, that's kind of annoying. Or, or, or I don't know if that annoys you, it bothers you, or it's kind of like, what? we're talking about money? Like, uh. But what would be crazy? It's not crazy that we're talking about it. What would be even crazier is that if there were people sitting in this room who said, you know what, I believe in God, I believe he sent his son Jesus, and I'm going to stake my whole eternity on that. And I'm going to believe that he gives me purpose and meaning in my life, but he can't touch my finances. That would be insane. That would be much more insane than us talking about it. Because if we actually believe that, if we actually believe that God created this world and he secures our eternity, and yet we, we said, you know what, I don't trust him with my finances, he wouldn't be a very good God then, probably. Because we're called to be generous people. It's hardwired into our DNA. 